go ahead and say your name and introduce yourself as you would. All right, John Major Jenkins. It's August 11th. No, April 11th. April Sorry. 11th. I say August 11th because All right, my brain. 31. Your face. Um, and I've written and books about the Maya cosmology and have done a lot of research on 2012 and Maya astronomy and uh, uh, Terence uh, was a friend of mine and an inspiration uh, for me and he wrote the uh, introduction to my book Maya Cosmogenesis 2012 1998. And so then when was the Either either vaguely or specifically, however it is you remember, when did you first become aware of Terence? I definitely remember that. Um, it was 1985, and I had just moved to Boulder, Colorado, so it was September, and I was living in Boulder, and I happened to have a little apartment right by the university, which was nice, because I'd go over there in the evenings, and they'd be open till midnight or something like that. So I'd be looking up books, you know, looking into some cool stuff, and uh, kind of had a range of interests at the time. Um, Native American cultures, uh, psychedelics, shamanism, things like that. So somehow I ran across... Um, the book in the card catalog or something like that. I don't know exactly how, but The Invisible Landscape was at the CU Library in Boulder, and mm -hmm. I checked it out. And I just thought it was the most amazing book. You know, it had this cachet to it that uh, these two brothers, you know, just and they look pretty young, you know, from the picture, you know. And, and, and Terrence McKenna and Dennis McKenna and just... They seem so intelligent and philosophical and thoughtful about the way they were presenting things. And of course, there's like what two mentions of 2012 in there, but you know, for me at the time, that didn't really mean anything. Sure. Of course, they didn't really even mention the Maya calendar right. in that book, in that edition of the book. Um, the thing that struck me about that was the experiment at La Terrera which of course is a very strange aspect of that book and then this crenellated ornate theory about dna and unzipping and rna transfers and electron spin resonance and and all this stuff which i actually found very fascinating i always loved reading like hardcore science stuff like that and uh, to me it struck me as like oh my god if this if this theory is correct that means that memories can be transmitted down from generation to generation okay. all this stuff really cool stuff so and then of course there's also a mention of hamlet's mill in there mm -hmm. and the well how did he phrase it in that book it was the heliacal rise of the galactic center also known as the galactic alignment as it would become known and that, you know, I don't have much of a memory of that, to be honest. I mean, it was probably a seed planted in my brain, you know, and then, well, that was one of many books that I, you know, read, but that one jumped, that one stuck with me, and then um, uh, I went to Mexico and Central America on my, my first trip, and then other things, and then I'm back in Boulder and decide to write my first book which I started in 87 and you know there's a lot of ups and downs with that process but um, by this time I was into the my calendar because of my travels and uh, which book was that this was journey to the Mayan underworld mm -hmm. I self-published it in 1989 I had my little mail order catalog and um, I didn't really seek uh, a trade publisher for it. I just kind of moved on to the next project and the next one and the next one. And then I got Zolkin published with uh, uh, Borderland Sciences Research Foundation. But that book, Invisible Landscape, was important to me when I was writing Journey to the Mind Underworld in like 88. 
80, early 89, because of the shamanism, because mm. of that theory. And I, I was developing my own ideas about the Maya calendar and the numbers of the Maya calendar and how that related to shamanism and so on. So I quoted uh, and cited the invisible landscape mm. in, in that first book of mine. But I didn't cite it for for the galactic alignment information, right. or the Hamlet's Mill stuff. Although, although again, in rereading it, all those I, those ideas, you know, were kind of seeded into my brain. Mm -hmm. But I wasn't even really thinking that much about 2012 at that time. Although I do mention it in that book. Mm -hmm. um, that book was also informed largely by uh, Frank Waters, mm -hmm. and another little book by a guy named Richard Luxton. Called the mystery of the Mayan hieroglyphs. Hmm. I know that one. It's an amazing book. The guy was uh, by the time he wrote that in 1981, he was already had his PhD in sociology and uh, anyway. But um, so uh, around that time, I also saw an article, interview or something with Terence in Magical Blend. Oh yeah. So that kind of put him on the map as being sort of a cultural icon of some kind, like a real guy that was out there. Because, of course, in the late 80s, you couldn't just go on Google and look people up. I mean, where are these people? I don't know. They don't have a Facebook page. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So to see him appear in some interview, probably Magical Blend or something, uh, uh, I, I thought that was really cool. And, and, so, he, so, and so Terrence kind of gained uh, uh, more cachet with me as like a real person. And then yeah. it must have been 1990 then that, you know, there were these clubs and these things you'd see in magazines. There was this I Ching network. I don't know where I saw that, but it was like, you know, join the I Ching network. And I thought the I Ching was cool. You know, the numbers and the, the 64 and... Um, Obviously, I was familiar with the novelty theory because mm -hmm. I'd read The Invisible Landscape mm -hmm. and the, the I Ching from that. So I joined that little network and received the mailer. And I and then there was a list of the other people in the club. And I saw Terrence McKenna's name on there. And they had the address. So this was all by mail. By yeah. Mail. Yeah. Yeah, I used to do things like that and uh, communicate with people and uh write letters and stuff like that and and it had his uh, address in i guess uh, sebastopol or something like that and sent him a sent him a letter and he responded and that was really cool and uh, he sent me a copy of his um the article that he wrote uh, called temporal temporal resonance mm -hmm. that appeared in i think revision magazine in 87 so it was like an off print uh from a couple years earlier um, but I think that he, I think that Terrence liked that article because it basically was a statement of his time wave zero theory in a very tight, compressed form, you know, with the argument and the uh, statement about it. And, uh, so, you know, that began, uh, in a somewhat infrequent, um, correspondence uh wasn't like you know fast friends or something like that but uh do you do you remember at all what you wrote him about in your initial um or... i think i introduced myself and said that i was doing research on the maya calendar and uh by that time i was probably working on zolkin or at least the beginning stages of zolkin so you think that's why he sent you the temporal resonance piece because it was connected to what you were working on? Or? Yeah, I think I was already I was already aware that um, the the number sixty four is embedded in the in the Maya calendar in a certain way that actually is interesting. It goes back to Tony Shearer's mm -hmm. idea with how you've got that thirteen by twenty number grid, mm -hmm. and then you've got the corner boxes and the way that that creates a crossover zone in the middle of the 
rectangle. And then that very middle part of the rectangle um, consists of 64 blocks. Is this the thing that then Jose... Jose picked up on that too, yeah, yeah. So I was playing a lot with uh, sacred geometry and mathematics and the sacred science principles, you know, the square root of five mm -hmm. and the square root of two and this kind of stuff. And, and stuff you were wrote in your Hello Kitty book? Yeah, it kind of culminated. That phase of my work culminated with the Hello K Show and 564 book that came out in 1994, which I renamed uh, Mayan Sacred Science in 2000. Um, so pretty soon, Terrence came to Boulder in 92. I think it was the summer of 92. He did a little talk in Boulder. And um, I went and saw it and, uh, you know, didn't, uh, you know, I was still pretty young and it was like, uh, uh, I, you know, you're naive and uh, it wasn't that, I was not really a bold person, really, um, but I was standing around the circle of people, you know, asking some, pitching some questions to him afterwards and stuff like that. Well, how, how old were you at that time? I would have been like uh, 28 at that time, 92. Okay. Um, so I didn't, I didn't like boldly introduce myself and say, hey, I'm the guy that you're corresponding with and, you know, about the Maya calendar. Um, but around that time, I finished my version of my book, Zolkin, Visionary Perspectives and Calendar Studies, uh, which is uh, like a spiral bound Xeroxed edition of it. And uh, that's, that got accepted for publication with Borderlands. And uh, what I used to do for my mail order catalog is I would produce these things at Kinko's basically mm -hmm. and have them spiral bound. And, and I had my mail order catalog going around and stuff like that. So this one had a lot of information about the Maya Venus calendar. I had, um, an idea in there about how the long count, the cartoon period endings of the long count, can basically predict seasonal quarters, either an equinox or a solstice, at regular intervals over the, these long periods, like centuries and thousands of years. And in my mind, this sort of like was one possible way that the Maya used the long count in order to target the solstice in 2012. So, you know, it's not something I ever really, it, it was a curious thing, uh, but it probably had to do with the internal periodicities in the long count more than anything else. Hard to know whether the Maya were aware of it themselves or not, but it was something that I emphasized to Terrence. I sent him a copy of my book when it was done in like August of 92. And emphasize that little tidbit to him. And we had some correspondence around that. Um, I may have talked to him on the phone once or twice around this period. Um, of course, at this time, he was uh, really achieving great success with his publications. Yeah. I think that um, that Archaic Revival book came out in 91, right? And then... Yeah, what else? Oh. Came out. And then uh, what? True, true Hallucinations. True Hallucinations. And, and then the reprint of uh, The Invisible Landscape was 93, 94. Yeah, it was a strange little thing there because I, I, I wanted to mention this um, because there, there was a crux period when I had some pointed communications with Terrence about 2012 and the Galactic Alignment. And it was in April, May, April, May, June kind of period of 93. Okay. And I had the correspondence. And to be honest, I was still like scratching my head about how, how to really language and think of this, 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 this thing that he pointed out in his book. And I, I read the passages in Hamlet's Mill about it which he pointed to, that's actually where they drew the information yeah. from, that there was this alignment of the solstice, you know, but of course it has to be 
sort of clarified that in the first edition of The Invisible Landscape, um, they didn't connect it to the Maya calendar, mm -hmm. and they didn't connect it, uh, like, e they didn't even really connect it to 2012, in a sense. I mean, it's kind of implied. They say that it's, this, they say this is the date we come up with through the, the Hiroshima yeah. edition thing is 2012. And then they say, and then there's this other possible way of looking for this end yeah. date through yeah. looking for when this moment, when the solstice yeah. sun crosses. Right, right. Well, they <laughs> called it the Haliathal Rise thing, but they pointed out correctly enough that it's hard to nail down exactly where the center of the galaxy <clears> is. If, if that was the criteria, if that was the criterion they were going to go with, the galactic center, well then, yeah, it's, it's prudent to acknowledge that the galactic center is like this rather large amorphous blob. The way that they said it was that, well, you know, there's a radio center, there's a light center, there's a gravity center. So they actually didn't really nail it down as precisely as even it was stated in the Hamlet's Mill book, where they basically said sometime around the turn of the millennium. Oh, yeah. Uh, Terence and Dennis kind of said, well, maybe it could be like 200 yeah. years. And so, so this is, this combined with the way that they stated it caused me to just have this open quandary about, about it. And again, it wasn't really a central part of my work, mm -hmm. uh, up until like 93, when I really started trying to think about, you know, why did they pick 2012? Uh, but it was through, um... Well, anyway, what I was going to say is that uh, we had a few exchanges about it and some other things. Uh, the second edition of The Invisible Landscape inserted a clarifying sentence in that passage, that one passage that they have about that. Um, however, it's... Um, uh, it's, a, it's a little misleading in the sense that in the first edition, they state that they were looking for eclipse occurrences on solstice dates. And then they had uh, identified different ones. And then this, the sentence that they inserted said that, and when this is done, we found the date December 21st of 2012. So the insertion of that new sentence in the second edition served the purpose of clarifying that they concurred with the exact date of December 21st of 2012, which wasn't stated in the first edition, but it was inserted in sort of an out-of-context way because it, an eclipse doesn't occur on that date. You know, so there's, a, there's a, another little sort of wild, uh, wild card in that, but uh, that second edition does state a publication year of 1993. However, the new introduction and the new acknowledgments are stated to be for the new 1994 edition. So, and, and the other thing too is that Terence's foreword, um, he dates as November of 1993. So even if that was the very final words that were written for the book, it's still got to go through proofreading and, and uh, you know, binding and printing. And so, I kind of had a half memory that I thought that book came out like more in 94 or something, you know, but then you go look at the copyright date and it says 93. Yeah. But I think for all intents and purposes, it basically didn't hit the shelves until early 94. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. 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 Um, okay. So the Ichkin group and then you had some correspondence and then so um and you okay so you were publishing Sulkin with Borderlands and the Invisible Landscape was coming out in 94 um so what was there any between 94 and 98 did you have 
further contact with parents? Or? Yeah, yeah, it actually sort of uh, was ramping up because I started producing essays and the chapters that would become Maya Cosmogenesis 2012. There were some early um, things, and uh, I would, um, like I had a, a small book that I produced pretty quickly called The Center of Mayan Time, and that was done in early 95. It was kind of preliminary research, but I was so excited about what I was finding with the archaeoastronomy at the site of the Zappa and um, some, some other things like the ball game symbolism and the um, my creation mythology and stuff. Um, that uh, I sent him a copy of that in early 95. The other thing that happened is uh, um, I kind of entered into the phase of the 2012 galactic alignment research because by the end of 93, uh, it finally had clicked for me, like, okay, I get, I get what it is. And also, by the way, this alignment is happening at this celestial feature called um, the Dark Rift in the Milky Way, which I knew from reading Dennis Tedlock's translation of the Hero Twin Creation myth, the Popol Vuh, the, the Dark Rift in the Milky Way was a very important feature in my creation mythology. It's like the Shabal Babay, the road to the underworld. And for me, this was like, oh my God, you know, and then not to mention the fact that it's the cro at the crossroads, at the crossing point of the Milky Way and the ecliptic, which, of course, if you read, you know, Friedel and Sheely's book, Maya Cosmos, which came out in 1993, well, she talks a lot about the uh, sacred tree being the uh, crossroads of the Milky Way and the ecliptic. That wasn't her original idea, by the way. It was, it was known by Raphael Girard and... Charles Wisdom and, and some other Maya scholars kind of recognized that that celestial cross in the sky was was most likely an expression of the, the Maya sacred tree cross in the creation myth symbolism. And then, of course, Dennis Tedlock also has that there, too. So I wrote um, in early 94, I wrote an article that got published later that year in December. Um, I sent it to Terrence, he liked it. So by mid-95 or so, um, it was either 95 or early 96 or something, um, he said he wanted to put it on his website. Mm. It was called The How and Why of the Mayan End Date in 2012. And uh, so I sent him a, a disc, you know, an old floppy thing, you know, big floppy disc, ASCII text, mm. you know, and. Because he had that, uh, you know, um, what was it called on the Levity site? What was his website called? Um, um, I don't even know what it is. Levity.com slash Yeah, yeah. Eschaton. Eschaton, yeah. So, um, yeah, and then he had his web guy, you know, post it, which was really cool because I hadn't quite gotten my own website launched yet. Uh, so it must have been in 95 when that happened. Because my, my website got launched in, in uh, like, October of 95. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I'm corresponding with Terrence, and we're talking about things. I, I think I must have had a... I, I did have a phone conversation with, with him uh, around, like, uh, the, uh, the file. Something, oh, some yeah. kind of technical details with the file, and we, we chatted for a bit. I can't remember if he was in Hawaii by this time, or... He was still in California. I had his phone number. I just can't remember where where he was. He might have been in Hawaii. Yeah. Well, the the big shift that happened is that um, I was doing a lot of research. I was living in Louisville, Colorado, and I would send Terrence, you know, my little articles and chapters and stuff and. Um, and, and I was tracking what he was up to, you know, there's um, interviews and, of course, his books were coming out, too, like, you know, Food of the Gods, and and, and that was really cool to see happen, and, uh, oh, yeah, that was the one we did, I knew there was one that, Food of the Gods, yeah, it was 92, I think, there. or something, yeah, 92, yeah, but then he was coming to Boulder again, so I was really psyched about that, he came to Boulder 
in uh, May of 1996. And he spoke at the Fox Theater on the Hill by the university. And my friend Jonathan Zapp writes about this mm. in his book. He's talked about it. Um, he was also doing a workshop at the Gold Lake Mountain Resorts, yeah, like west of Boulder in the, in the mountains, which I also signed up for. And that was the occasion of, uh, well, let, let me back up a little bit. At the talk that Terrence did um, at, the time. at the Fox Theater, um, we, we hadn't really met in person except for that one time back in 92, which was just a long time before. When oh, he, the time when, where you he, weren't quite bold enough. Yeah, to... he, I mean, I was there and mm. a group of people and stuff like that. But... Uh, so I stood and I asked a question because he gave this whole talk and he didn't really mention the Maya calendar, you know, really, with tw in relation to 2012. So I sort of leadingly introduced it with a question I asked and he, he intuited that I was the guy who had been sending him all this research. <laughs> and it was, it was kind of a, a, a nice moment because mm -hmm. it was an acknowledgement and a recognition because mm -hmm. I really did look up to him a lot. I mean, I think a lot of people did. I think a lot of people, just the way that he could navigate and introduce these complicated topics in a way that was very accessible and interesting and fascinating, uh, absolutely incredible. I mean, so many of my friends, you know, I went with some of my friends to that, and um, so that was that was really amazing uh, to see Terrence talk, and then of course. At the Gold Lake Mountain Resort event, he, he did a huge workshop on the novelty wave thing, and uh, he invited me to lunch. And um, it was a bit strange because he was in a little bit of a snafu at that moment, doing the weekend workshop in Colorado. He had an event coming up in California. And I can remember having lunch with him, and we were chatting and talking. And by this time, my book, My Cosmogenesis 2012, was about 80% finished. Mm -hmm. And I had most of the stuff written for it. And I asked him about uh, publicity and, not publicity, I mean like uh, uh, publishers. Mm -hmm. And um, he said something really funny. He said a couple of things that were really funny. One was that uh, I expressed that I was having a hard time interesting um, the university publishers in it. As I mentioned to you uh, mm -hmm. uh, earlier, Kevin, I, I had been cold calling some university presses and pitching the book, but as within 10 seconds, you know, I mentioned 2012. It was just like, you know, no, thank you. Uh, and Terrence said, you know, something like, well, if you want the scholars to pay attention to your work, you have to get somebody to fall in love with you. <laughs> and uh, then another thing he said, because he had, he had done that Trilogues book um, with uh, Rupert Sheldrake and Abraham with, uh, Barron. With, with Barron Company, right? They did that with Barron Company. <clears throat> and I asked them about Barron Company, and he, his face just kind of went like, he said, well, you got to better watch out for the squirrels in that area of the park, <laughs> something like that. And, of course, I should have taken that uh, advice, you know, because I ultimately, there was a very serendipitous opening that happened at Baron Company at a moment that was just nicely timed with where I was at. And I was wanting to get that book out there as soon as possible. So I went for it, and on some levels I really regret that. But at the same time, they... They thought that having Terrence write the introduction to that to that book was um, was a great idea. Anyway, that was that was still a couple of years off in the future, or at least a year and a half off in the future. But um, the other thing that happened, we were having lunch, and uh, it was you know it was just. Um, it was just nice sitting there talking to Terrence. You know, he was very uh, easygoing. Was it just the two of you? Or? Yeah, 
Yeah, there was some. There, I mean, he had other people with him, but they were off doing something. Yeah. And but then there was a call that came in, and we had pretty much finished lunch anyway. But a call came in; he had to deal with. And later, I found out that um, they had just threatened to cancel his event in California. Did you hear about you, this? Uh, yeah, the UCLA yeah. snafu. Did you hear about this? Oh yeah. Because they were invoking a law where you couldn't talk about illegal subjects on campus or something like that. <clears throat> and he was going to be talking about psychedelics. Right? Yeah. So, yeah, the, the VA canceled his talk. UCLA um, basically disowned and canceled his venue. Wow. And they gave him... Another venue, like, but said it's not affiliated with us. Oh, ho, ho. and he, oh, wow. he basically, I was actually, I was just listening to this interview while this was all going on, and he's, he's actually like suing them, basically, like he's, wow. and he's getting all these people to call the governor, call the incredible, like, as a, like. First Amendment constitutional like free yeah. speech issue. So it was, yeah, really. And then I, I found as I was going through <clears throat> archival stuff, like going through newspaper databases, looking for Terrence, I kept coming up in that, in that period in '96 with all these articles about like Terrence versus the VA. Wow! And, yeah, wow! So um, I don't think a lot of people really know about it but it was like That's it was terrence's moment where he was like battling the yeah. forces of the government and well he must have had some people on his side you know to some some leverage with lawyers yeah, i think they won like that. actually yeah anyways no that's that's <laughs> i'm glad to hear that second part of the story but uh right. he uh that's yeah so <laughs> so 96 i was wrapping up the book and then, well, things changed in my life. You know, I, I met my future wife and moved to Denver and things kind of unfolded there. Uh, but I, I had, I'd finished my book and um, by kind of mid-97, well, what had happened is I finished my book and then, like I usually did, I produced Xerox copies of it and um, sold some copies through my mail order catalog. I, I really wanted to try to get it published with, um, like a, some kind of university press or something. Mm -hmm. I don't know. The options were kind of limited at the time, but then this opening o opened up with Baron Company, and they offered me uh, an advance and a contract. So I mean, I, to be honest, I mean to this day, I wish I would have looked that contract over a little more clearly. Because the, one of the clauses has to do with when the rights revert to you. Oh. And I, I don't know how other authors, you know, like Terrence have dealt with this, you know, uh, because you can say that it's out of print if it's selling less than 10 copies a period. Mm. But if you don't say anything, then they have their little sneaky ways of doing Hollywood accounting. They basically keep a book in a drawer and say it's still in print. So I've been trying to get the rights back to that book for like three years now. And it, it, it literally, okay, what happens is that for each six month accounting period, it might sell two copies or one copy. And then they're still getting returns. Like, okay, it's a 2012 book and it was published 18 years ago. So it doesn't sell anymore. It's out of, basically out of print, but you know, they'll say, well, it sold two copies or one copy. Mm -hmm. But then the real thing is that they're still getting returns from a distributor, the random bookstore oh, that wow. finds a copy on the shelf yeah. and they send it back. So I'll, I'll have like, you know, one sale or two sales and 12 returns. Yeah. So it's less than out of print. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, you know what I mean? Negative. Yeah. It's negative. I'm, I'm like losing money on the book because they'll deduct those returns from my account. Really? Yes. Because I already got paid for that sale when it was sent out to the right. distributor. Oh my God. And then they send it back and they deduct it. So it's like, my book is less than in print now. Yeah. You know? Anyway, I didn't mean to go into that digression. The thing is like, things were happening and... Uh, 
96, 97. So I sent uh, an e by now it's like emails, emails happening, and I sent an email to Terrence and and uh, he responded. We I remember having a conversation with him about. Uh, um, his, I remember it was by this time it was when he responded. It was like late '97, and I had already gotten the contract with Baron Company, and I pitched the idea to him to like write the intro, and he liked the idea, and um, we had a couple of phone conversations, and um, I we talked once about like how he had migraines, like really mm -hmm. bad migraines. I think I mentioned that I I hurt my back. I hurt my back around that time and I had to do like uh, acupuncture and stuff like that. And, you know, it was, we had just, just normal conversations about things. We also, it's different times. We talked about uh, Arguez once. Oh, yeah. I think one time, like, cause Never really heard Terrence talk about him. Well, I, I guess I kind of brought it up because I was like, um, yeah, you know, it, all these dream spell people, and I have to, like, respond to these, you know, letters and try to explain things to them. And, and he said something like, um, you should be glad that your uh, opponent is as... Um, I don't want to put the wrong words in his mouth, but uh, is as easy as Arguez or mm. something like that, you know, which I guess was, you know, saying that um, Arguez's work was just easy to identify the problems with, which I'd already done, so it was fair enough, you yeah. know. Uh, but he was aware of Arguez, and um, mm -hmm. another time we talked about, he asked me about um, the guy, oh, what was that guy's name? Um, Bellamy. A guy named Bellamy wrote this amazing book about the uh, Peruvian monuments. It, had, it was sort of like part of the Horbiger theory of the moon and... Uh, like the the whole idea that um, oh this is an older book yeah the Bellamy yeah, book yeah, goes yeah. back okay, to yeah, yeah. Uh, I think it's called the Calendar of Tiafuanaco or something okay. like that and um, about I you know and I never really gave those theories much credence you know I but I think that it it might have had to do with the idea that the moon is actually you know um, was blown out of the earth from a from a cometary impact early on or something like that. We talked about some wacky things. We I also brought up once. Uh, um, what was it? The uh, the oh, I brought up this. This was kind of a stick in my craw for a while, but I wasn't really quite sure how to present it, you know. But I realized that Terence was willing to talk about stuff, including critiques of his own theories and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So I had brought up the whole thing of, well, you know, if if the galactic alignment is somehow empirically the thing in nature, not that I'm saying it is, but if it is the thing in nature that defines this novelty eschaton thing that you talk about in your theory, then how can we nail it down to one day? You know, because the galactic alignment is defined by the slow mm. shifting of the procession of the equinoxes. Mm. And I always ascribe to there being uh, a range. Yeah. In fact, I introduced that 36-year alignment yeah. zone range into the discussion to kind of avoid yeah. that somewhat unrealistic assumption that something amazing was going to happen right on that day, which I... I mean, I do believe that December 21st, 2012 is the accurate calendrical artifact. I mean, that has to do with the correlation question. Mm -hmm. But whatever alleged effects or the thing or, you know, mm -hmm. doomsday or whatever is <clears throat> supposed to happen, you know, if people believe things, something's going to happen. So that was one thing that came up. And, uh, well, and, and this became a point, too, even after the book, where you really had to publicly distinguish your and yeah. parents' views from each other. Yeah. 
Yes, that remind, reminds me of another thing that might be interesting, because this, this could be a, a piece of writing that you could, uh, well, I have a copy of it, mm -hmm. um, is that I wasn't, I, I didn't expect that just because Terrence wrote the foreword and that he wrote about 2012 and now I'm writing about 2012, is that undiscerning critics or reviewers were going to assume that I was sort of like just following in the mold of what Terence's work was. Right. I mean, right. it, it was different by a, a right. huge yeah, I mean, because Terence's fractal model really yeah. necessitates this right. like, dramatic and... It's a totally moment. different model. I mean, it's a totally different approach. Yeah. I mean, I was trying to reconstruct what the Maya thought about it. You know, that was at best, ancillary, you know, to Terrence's stuff. In fact, for all the times that he mentioned 2012, mm -hmm. he hardly ever mentioned 2012 in conjunction with talking about the Maya calendar yeah, or the Maya. It didn't come up that If often. it ever came up, it was that point about shamanism and the strange fact that both the Maya and he did mushrooms. And that was a, that was a, a, a clever sort of thing that he, he would talk about. Um, so the, the thing I was going to mention is that, jumping ahead a little bit here, after the book came out, there was a review that occurred in Magical Blend. And, uh, and, and they did that thing with it where they just, they, I mean, maybe I was overreacting or, or a little sensitive or something, but they made it seem like I was just, you know, following in the in, in the ideas of Terence or something like that. Well, yeah, it's true that Terence and Dennis mentioned what has become known as the galactic alignment, you know, and I give credit where credit's due in terms of my own process, you know, having been sort of seeded with that idea through their book and stuff like that. So, uh, I forget what the guy's name was, but... Um, I pointed this out to Terrence, and it, it was really not, it was kind of a, a silly uh, review. I mean, it really wasn't well written, and I, I guess I expected more, mm. you know. I guess mm -hmm. I've always been sort of like idealistic in that way of expecting more out of the world or other researchers or something i don't know <laughs> but yeah. but anyway well, so, when you put that much effort into something yeah, you want to see it treated. sure so terence offered to write a corrective statement letter to the editor and he did and it got published and maybe must have been by that time it must have been like one of the early um issues from like early 1999 or something like that i've got i've got a copy of it somewhere so that's another little you know ephemera from from terence you yeah know. no i mean i just it it is when you really understand Terence's time wave and you understand what you're saying i mean yeah. they're really significantly different it's hard to confuse this sort of dramatic necessity unimaginable end date with yeah um yeah my whole thing being you know Pretty, pretty much a good old-fashioned reconstruction, you know, based upon the ball game and the creation myth. And I, I do remember when I presented that, uh, when I contacted Terrence about that, um, when he offered to, like, write, because he knew all those editors. I mean, I knew that he knew those yeah, people, right, and so yeah. it's like, I'm sure it was going to be smooth operation. Yeah. But, but he did say, he did say that uh, he had long... Uh, suffered the abuse of being whipsawed by clueless critics or something like yeah. that. And I'm sure he did. Yeah, yeah. And I, I wish I had that same kind of ability to let things slide off my back, but I, I kind of ju just made differently somehow. Well, just so you don't feel too bad, it feels the same way for a scholar when, I, when you get peer review. Yeah. And I, when I get peer review... I'm like, the fuck are you talking about? Yeah, I go, well, so, I, mean, I, 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 I appreciate you saying that, and uh, yeah, I just, I don't know how you guys do it, you know, year, year after year after year, because, 
Yeah. Um, well, there was a... Okay, so what happened... Let me uh, keep keep going as long yeah. as the brain is unfolding sure. the narrative yeah, here. Yeah, Let's yeah. see. Um, the book came out uh, in May of 1998. Um People received copies in June or something like that. I don't know, but he sent me an email that was really nice, and he congratulated me. And then he was coming out to Boulder, and uh, well, I actually left a message on my phone. Uh, is what happened, and um, so he came out to Boulder to speak at Naropa, and then then uh, there was a party at uh, Robert Vanosa's house, Martina Hoffman and Robert Vanosa. After that, after that, and uh, that was that was a lot of fun. We all sat around the table there, and it was kind of uh, epic. My my then fiance, we were going to be married uh, pretty soon after that. She was there, and it was uh, it was really nice, I like hanging out there. And uh, um, we, I mean, I'd met Robert and Martina at the Gold Lake Mountain Ranch mm, thing two years nice. previously. They were up there too. Uh, something happened around that time that I sort of reconstructed later is that uh, um, oh, I always forget this guy's name Grossinger Richard Grossinger, oh, yeah, Richard Grossinger. Um, he North Atlantic oh, books yeah North Atlantic books um well, I I don't need to I don't really need to go there. He he wrote a book called Twenty Thirteen that came out. Yeah. I don't really need to go there with this, but but Terrence was doing talks and um, I I do there's a recording of a talk that he did in the summer of ninety eight that I listened to just recently. Maybe it was something that you had a link to uh, from somewhere. Maybe in the notes to your Novo Religio thing or mm. something. And so I noticed that oh that's from like. A, just like a couple of months after I saw I saw Terrence, mm. and I listened to the whole thing, and um, it was the one where he uh, some somebody brought up the galactic alignment thing with twenty twelve, mm. and uh, he he kind of just rolled right over it. He didn't he didn't want to get into it. It is kind of a big topic. I mean, and he probably had. Like I experienced many times, you start going into that, you know, with procession and this alignment and the solstice sun and all this stuff, people start to glaze over, you know, and it's sort of a complex topic. But I'd be interested in knowing, because I have listened to a lot of his talks and I'm always listening for um, whether or not he's mentioning the rare times that he might mention the Maya calendar. Mm -hmm. And 2012, with if he would, you know, mention the galactic alignment. And after yeah. all, it kind of goes back to their book, you know, and Alex Mill before that. That one I think from '93 where he talks about it in a little bit of detail, and he talks about finding it on a computer program. And oh, stuff. really? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, that's. Uh, yeah, by the way, like computer programs, that can be the way that you can sort of internalize some of these astronomical things. Mm. But there was a kind of a synchronicity thing that happened in late 1998 with Terence. It was December 13th of 1998. So I had already done my West Coast tour thing and my other promo events for the book. I was still doing events. And I was doing a talk at the Tattered Cover Bookstore in Denver. And I remember this specific date because my friend Stephen came and videotaped it, which was um, kind of a big deal at the time for me. I hadn't done that, that many events, you know, and uh, some of them were getting recorded, audio tape and stuff like that. But anyway, um, so I was in Denver doing this talk and... Terence was somewhere on the West Coast or something doing a talk on the very same day. Mm -hmm. And there's a video online, and it's kind of interesting because uh, David Ulancey, mm -hmm. 
who teaches at the California Institute of Integral Studies and wrote that amazing book on Mithraism, uh, who I've met several times, you know, since then. In fact, I was in touch with him around that time, or maybe a little bit after that time, because he and one of his colleagues were were, were speculating on the uh, on the galactic alignment thing from the vantage point of, of astrology, basically, right. like Rick Tarnas and um, I can't remember that other guy's name, but uh, and David and there was a little email exchange we all had. It, that was probably 1999. But I didn't know that this talk had happened and that David was there. But in the in the video for the talk, after the talk, David Ulancey, uh stands and asks a question about the galactic alignment. Mm -hmm. And Terrence responded uh, by um, summarizing my work and, and mentioning mm -hmm. my book, My Cosmic Genesis 2012. So it was, it was that those kind of things were very um, validating in a certain yeah. sense. But the synchronicity there is that on that very same day, I was doing a yeah, talk with talk. slides in Denver at the same time. So now we're getting up to the point where, of course, um, you, do you want more stories uh, sure. along this, this period of time? Mm -hmm. there, there were a couple of synchronicity things. I've mentioned them in some of the interviews I've done recently. I, I, never, I didn't really talk about these things a lot, but they, they kind of strike me as being worth mentioning. Uh, I'll kind of backtrack a little bit as long as we're getting into the synchronicity thing. Uh, one is the fact that I have this bizarre drawing that I apparently did when I was on my seventh birthday. Have you ever heard this, this story? I, I don't familiar. think I even wrote about it in any of my books. But I mentioned it in a, on the radio interview I did with Marty Leeds. And... Uh, my grandma kept all these little drawings from childhood, and uh, there was one I did apparently because it's dated March fourth, my seventh birthday. It's the only day of the year that's a command. Yes, exactly. That's what I used to say, <laughs> and I saw that Terrence said that once, didn't he? Did he? I think so. I got it from a friend of mine who's a big Terrence enthusiast, so she might have got it from him. Well, I think he said it in relation to the fact that the experiment of La Chorrera was initiated on the evening of March 4th. Interesting. And that's okay. the synchronicity, because this drawing I have, my seventh birthday is March 4th of 1971, oh, wow. and this drawing I have is of sort of this undulating, well, first of all, there's all the little grass things, and they almost look like little X's and almost like, you know, little like hieroglyphics or something. And then there's a, a big fat mushroom, with four dots, you know, classic, you know, Disney mushroom, right there in the, in the center yeah. of the picture. And then in the middle distance behind it is this kind of like voluptuous undulating hills of the goddess Earth, you know. And then in a crevice between the hills is just a little kite string that comes up from way behind the hills. And floating right over the mushroom is a, like a four-sided kite. With little kite strings. So there's this like invisible entelechy holding the kite string behind the hill, and the kite is flying in the sky right over the mushroom that has four little dots on it. And that drawing was done on the day that the experiment That's of La Chirera was initiated. Um, that is weird. Have you ever read Terrence wrote an essay that was like an afterword for? Um, a co it was actually, it was a book called In Pursuit of Valis, and it was like the exegesis, it was like pre-exit oh. before they actually published the exegesis, it was like sections oh. from the exegesis, and, and Terrence wrote an afterword for it called I Understand Philip K. Dick, and I, it's all about that, all these synchronicities in 1971, wow. where the stuff was happening with Terrence <laughs> and Phil Dick. At the same I'd time, I'd love to read that. It's Is great. it in the exegesis as published? It's I have not that. in the exe the new exegesis. It's okay. in this old collection, but you can find it online. Okay. So okay. if you just type in Terrence McKenna, I oh, I'd love to check that out. It's amazing. It's, and he talks about he talks about him thinking that on his birthday in 1971, 
after he got back from the Amazon that it was all going to happen. So he was like, he sat himself down in the morning, like rolled wow. up a joint, like totally expecting it all to just like fold in. And, like, <laughs> um, and like at the same time, like Philip K. Dick was wow. being Oh, on, robbed, the, on that day, on that like, day. Yeah. Amazing. That is so bizarre. <laughs> Better. Well, as 1999 opened up, um, I, I had been invited uh, by Terence, and I was in touch with Christian Reich mm. in Germany. And I, I later I later saw a book that he did with his wife. Um, I can't remember her name. Christian or Cat Harrison? Uh, Christian Reich's oh, wife. Um, they did a book together, and. Uh, I was I was really heartened to see that they mentioned my cosmogenesis in there, those little things. Uh, but anyway, they invited the me to Claudia be. Claudia. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. There you go. That's it. Well, anyway, they invited me to um, be like uh, a tour leader for the Ethnobotany Conference oh. at Palenque. No kidding. Yeah, because I you know I've been there like a couple times and to the conference. Yeah, and. Um, that was ninety nine, and uh, it it didn't it didn't click for that time. It was it was kind of a strange. Oh, wait, sorry, I just want to clear. So you are you saying you've been down to the ethnobotany conference before? or You'd been down to Palenque region. I've been down to Palenque before. Okay. I'd never been you've to never an been ethnobotany okay. conference. Just yeah. clarifying. My point in telling this is that in April of nineteen ninety nine, Terence came to Denver, and uh, he spoke at the. Um, you know, uh, what do they call it? The uh, um, God, what do they call that thing? One of those conferences. Um, it was like um, oh, it was the whole life the whole life expo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have the. I was listening to that recording. In that the car. very same one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. He talks. I was there at the talk, mm -hmm. but the way I was able to attend the talk was very serendipitous is um, that my wife was away for the, my future, my almost wife was <laughs> away for the weekend. I didn't have any resources. I had no money in my pocket. But I went downtown anyway and just showed up. Because it was like, you know, 30 bucks to get in or something like that, you know. And, and so I just figured, well, I'll just show up. And so I'm walking down the hall... There's Terrence walking right towards me. And uh, we we stopped, and he was basically heading over to do his talk. Oh, uh, yeah. And we said hi, and we chatted for a bit, and he, he like, handed me a pass to get in. Yeah. And uh, so I was able to go listen to his talk. Yeah. And then afterwards, there was, you know, chatting and people uh, hanging out and talking and stuff like that. That was cool. Hmm. But of course, by April of 1999, that was literally like a month before yeah. he had his seizure in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm not sure if I'm covering covering the ground that you'd like me to, or or should I reflect in a different way? Upon no, that's good. I mean, I guess there's there's two sort of main edges right there's the sort of straight historical stuff in yeah. terms of when Sequences. did you meet him and where yeah. and um and then there's just the sort of i guess broader reflections like um moving forward what what kinds of things do you think people can Take away from Terence moving forward. Well, I guess the things I think of that should inspire a lot of people about Terence, that inspired me about Terence, is that he was a free thinker, and he could exercise discernment, and he could think things through, and he also sort of integrated the. I mean. I'm not sure if you'd say that he was a spiritual guy or something. He probably would even forsake that label. But he had this ability to um, look clearly at things. 
And I think that's inspiring. It should be inspiring. Because I think what he was about and what he strove to be in his life is something that a lot of people want to accomplish. Not in a sense of writing books or something like that, but um, in exploring reality and being open-minded and open to new experiences and courageous about going into the unknown. I mean, he really was an explorer on the, on the caliber of like a Magellan or something like that, but he was an explorer of mapping out the inner landscape. And uh, I, think, I think for me and for a lot of people, um, he was like a guide in a sense, either through example, just like for me, I saw him as an intellectual making a living, you know, as a speaker and, and an author. But uh, I, I sort of embraced and internalized this value of like communicating your ideas to other people and how important that was and not just not just as like a, a doing a monologue at the podium which of course he did a lot and we, we all do that if we're giving a talk about something but more importantly like engaging a dialogue with the audience like I always like taking questions I mean, for, like for me in my work, I always thought that was an important thing to do is to open it up. Or, or just generally, apart from conference speaking venues, to, to have an open door for uh, communicating about or discussing or debating, you know, uh, the, my, my ideas that you put out there. So on some weirder level that is hard to put my finger on, and maybe this is true for other people, I've thought of him as sort of like a, a psychopompos, you know, like that, that, that guide who would initiate you into a deeper understanding somehow. I don't know why he, he, he sort of carried this quality, but he would appear in dreams, and he'd always appear in dreams in a, in a really, really interesting way, where he was like, you know, opening opening a door on a secret uh, uh, cavern of some kind, filled with uh, wisdom or something. I don't know. Yeah. It's, uh, I mean, not to. I mean, every, he, everybody has uh, different different uh, things, and um, you know, I I was not like. Um, I wouldn't say that like we were super close friends. I'm not gonna like pretend that. I mean, I think we had a respectful acquaintance and communication on the level of ideas and our work and things like that. And, um, but I think we were sort of on the, on the same, we, we had the same sort of um, goal, I think, you know. And uh, I don't know, I guess, I guess I sort of appreciated him just encouraging, encouraging me along as I was as I was going through, and like sending him things and talking about some things and things like that. It was just friendship. It was really it was really sad, you know, to hear when he had that um, seizure. That was actually a strange thing too. Can I can I share a little synchronicity with that? It was. The weekend I got married, and we went to Durango for our honeymoon, and it was like uh, mid-May, you know, and uh, so we were driving back to Denver, and we went through Paonia, mm -hmm. and driving down that the, the mountain from Paonia, I recalled a dream that I had had the previous night, and I was... I guess, I guess because I was thinking, that, well, this is where Terrence grew up, you know. And then I recalled this dream, and <laughs> it was so strange because 
I was like skiing down a mountain, you know, I don't really ski, but I was skiing, you know, and the zigzag back and forth. And in my dream, I was thinking this zigzag thing, it's like the time wave. Oh, wow. And then I look over to my left and, and Terrence is coming down on a set of skis and he's going, whoosh, whoosh, and he looks over and he goes, you can't see it till you ski it. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> But the weird thing about this is that after we got back to Denver, uh, you know, I found out, you know, a couple days later or whatever, like what that, that Terrence had had, that, that seizure thing, it, it had happened on that morning. And that whole story is when, you know, the, it's so dramatic, like they had to, he was basically heading down the mountain, you know, and, and uh, his girlfriend got him in the into the truck and then he... Had a seizure by the side of the road, and mm. yes, but um, it was it was a huge loss. Like I, I I wonder what parents would be saying about things. I think I read somewhere that Dennis said maybe it was in the Brotherhood of the Abyss book, uh, which came out in 2012, so relatively recently. And if Terrence had lived to see all these things with 9/11 and you know, that, that he probably wouldn't have been all that surprised, you know, but I don't know. I think, I think if he, if, if, I don't know, what do you think? I mean, if he saw all this stuff with iPhones and he was a technology guy, so he'd probably love a lot of this oh, stuff. Oh, I think but... the, the iPhones he would have predicted. I think, I don't, my impression is that he wasn't anticipating 9-11 and what, sort of the in in his terms the sort of fall into habit in a way mm, that mm. that came as mm. a result of that yeah um i mean i think i mean in in terence in one, one of terence's narratives i mean by not much later than that we would have had starships the size of texas <laughs> right, kind of right. thing. Yeah. Um, so yeah. i mean and maybe we do. <laughs> Breakaway <laughs> civilization. Um, but no, I don't know. I I think it's it's an interesting. There there's this notion that there um, it's in the, especially in the nineties and um, the sort of technological vision that Terrence had, um, the sort of optimistic te technological vision that Terrence had, made a lot more sense in a way than mm -hmm. it does in the post 9-11 yeah. era. Yeah. Um, my impression is that, yeah, he was coming out of like a, a period where there was such growth and optimism and that mm -hmm. like he sort of, I mean, he basically died as Clinton's going yeah. out, Bush is coming yeah. in. Right. And I mean, and I'm listening to a bunch of, talks from that period where he's like talking about Clinton a lot and he's yeah. got a lot of like negative things mm. to say but I mean but overall I mean he's talking <clears throat> about this period of great economic growth and these like um yeah. all these things that I don't think he would have anticipated turned in the way that we all live with now mm -hmm. yeah um, how long would you say his speaking career went? I think there's some recordings from 82 yeah, or 81. So 82, to 80, 82 to 9. I, Is no, there anything I, earlier than 82 um, that you know of? Or? No. I don't, um, with, it seems that... So there's stuff in 82. His first SLN talk was in 82. Yeah. Um, in the earliest recordings, he refers to like a couple things that he's talked at before. Mm -hmm. um, but as far as I, I don't know of anything yeah. before 82, neither does Bruce Damer or Lorenzo Haggerty. Okay. Um, so that, that's sort of where we place the beginning of his speaking right. career. One of the, it's amazing that uh, he was able to do some of these. I mean, when I listen to some of his early talks, uh, a lot of his thoughts and ideas are really fully formed, even at a very yeah. early stage. Mm -hmm. And that talking aloud thing, what is that? The, oh, uh, thinking th aloud. Th thinking aloud. 
That's great. I mean, that's on Jeffrey that's on Mishlov. Jeffrey Mishlov, yeah. That is just... I, I don't know. It's the, just like, the, uh, is it the I Ching one, the time wave one? Or? No, I don't think so. Um, I, I don't know. It's like... I go through periods of not listening to anything, and then... And then I'll listen to something, and uh, it's just like... Uh, yeah. It's one of the few things that... Um, <laughs> Daniel Pinchbeck <laughs> said that I think was really astute, is he said, uh, when you when you don't listen to Terrence for a while, <laughs> you, it seems kind of cartoonish and uh, uh, silly and... and uh, you get that you build up this sort of caricature version, oh. and then when you actually go back and listen, it's just like detailed oh, and on point, yeah. and like you're, yeah. um, in and your memory, it kind of just goes to this uh, cartoonish kind of place or something like that. Yeah, but then when you listen to it again, it's it's just good stuff. Mm -hmm. Wow, wow, yeah. Well, I I miss them. You know, it's. I think things could have been way different in the public discourse. You know, I don't, there's such a unique, unique person. You know, lending so much insight. 